Good afternoon, everyone. This is Stuart Stone, the Director of Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center. Today we have a webinar focusing on the societal impacts uh, of nanotechnologies and its, and its role in um, various philosophical, religious, and cultural aspects. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Gregory Nichols, our pro Vice Program Manager over at RE. Greg? Thanks, Stuart. Appreciate everybody for your attendance today, and I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes or so to talk to you about a topic that I find quite fascinating and just thrilling, and it is nanotechnology. The interesting thing about nanotechnology is that it is such a new technology, it's something that society has never really had to face before, and all of the things that it can potentially do are going to change our lives, and there's a lot of implications philosophically, culturally, and religiously that we still haven't fully considered the impact of. So today I'm just going to give you a little bit of a taste of some things that we need to start thinking about, and hopefully I'll give you a more well-rounded approach to what nanotechnology is and what it could be. So first of all, what is nanotechnology? Basically, we're talking about the manipulation of matter on a scale in nanometers. So a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So just to put that into some perspective for you, if the Earth were a meter, a marble would be a nanometer. We're talking about a billion times in size difference. So when we're talking about manipulating things on the nano scale, these are extremely small, small uh, sizes. And so this slide just shows some things in kind of an everyday picture. If you look at a person, a person would be about 2 billion nanometers tall. So extremely big, right? We don't talk about billions of nanometers. We say that a person is, you know, several meters tall. But when we get down to things like carbon nanotubes and DNA, these things are one to two nanometers. So just a size that we can't even comprehend. And modern science has given us the ability to actually manipulate individual atoms. And as you can kind of imagine, it's created this whole new world of possibilities, but it's also quite scary. And there's a lot of things that we don't completely understand yet. And so this slide just kind of shows some of the potential uses of nanotechnology and some of the current uses. And I think probably everybody here has used sunscreen at some time in their lives. Well, most sunscreens contain nanoscale titanium dioxide. It's a compound that makes sunscreens and other products very, very white. The smaller the particles, the whiter a pigment can be. Uh, some other things like dietary supplements, they often have nanoscale materials inside of them. Uh, they help to deliver the nutritional stuff better or the uh, the medication, whatever it is. Um, the dry wicking materials that are often used for workout clothes, these things often have nanoscale silver particles in them and they are there to reduce odor. Another thing that probably most of us have had and don't even realize, um, Dunkin' Donuts is a good example of how titanium dioxide and nanoparticles are used in food colorings and dyes. Now recently, because of some public perception issues, Dunkin' Donuts decided that they were going to remove the nanoscale titanium dioxide from the glazes in their donuts. But still, just to show you a little bit of a taste of where nanomaterials can be found. And I want you to keep this slide in mind because we're gonna talk about some public perceptions here later on in this presentation. So here's just a quick outline of where we're heading with all of this. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about philosophy and how that applies to nanotechnology. Then we'll move on to some cultural aspects. We'll talk a little bit about how different religions view nanotechnology and other technologies. And then we'll talk about what I like to call acceptance. Now that nanotechnology is here and we know some of the issues, how are we going to deal with these issues? So first of all, just to kind of get you in the mindset of what is philosophy, philosophy is basically the study of, of knowledge, of, of wisdom. It's, it's understanding our world. It's understanding how things work and, and the implications of, of our actions. And these are some concepts that I think really tie into where nanotechnology can possibly go. Just a couple here that I have listed. Transhumanism is the idea that somehow we could supersede our human species, that we could have different sorts of additional 
materials or um, symbiotic relationships or, or something to make us more than just a regular human, right? You know, super people, super beings, something like that. The technological singularity is often synonymous with artificial intelligence, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It just is a concept that basically says there, there will come some points in our existence that machine intelligence will surpass the human capacity for intelligence. So we're talking about possibly artificial intelligence. We're talking about self-replicating machines. Nanotechnology is certainly something that is helping uh, this concept happen. Uh, human performance modification, the idea, again, that we can become sort of, of superhuman beings, that we can use implants and other bionic interfaces and things to make our human bodies more powerful, uh, better than they already are. And then finally, nanotechnology in conjunction with biotechnology uh, can actually help extend our lives. Uh, a good example of this is Google, right? They're investing billions of dollars into a project where they want to extend the normal human lifespan to 200 years. So that conjunction of nanotechnology with tissue engineering and other sorts of things is kind of how they expect to get there. And so as I mentioned earlier, artificial intelligence is one of those philosophical things that, you know, people have toyed with for many years and have contemplated, you know, could we build something, could we build a machine that was just as smart or even smarter than a human being? A good example of this would be IBM's Watson. I think many of you probably either saw Watson play on Jeopardy or maybe have heard about this, and I think Watson actually did quite well. But there are other machines and other computers and other sorts of interfaces that will be available because of nanotechnology, because of the small scale and quantum computing and all of these things that are now possible. From a Department of Defense perspective, uh, the DOD is looking at artificial intelligence in the sense of creating autonomous weapons, right? And I have a picture here of a Predator aircraft. But imagine if you could use things like carbon nanotubes to create some sort of pseudo neural net where you could have a computer within a drone or something that would be just as smart as a human that could actually calculate these complex algorithms on its own and know where certain targets were and it could act on these, these data on its own. Now, that also brings up some interesting implications, right? What if we have, you know, these autonomous robots and drones running amok, right, fighting their own wars and doing things that they probably shouldn't do? Well, in order to prevent that, Department of Defense has actually issued a directive, 3000.09, back in November of 2012, that basically said, we know that this is a possibility. In order to prevent this from happening, we're going to program our autonomous machines so that they cannot act unless a human being actually authorizes that um, attack or that um, operation or whatever it is. Now, ironically, if you actually do believe in the singularity, there will be some point to which that won't matter, that the machines will be so intelligent that they will actually figure out a loophole and get around that whole human interface. But for the time being, I think that is a, um, a stopgap that is pretty accurate, and I think that will probably work. These are just some things that we have to keep in mind as our capacity as human beings increase because of technology, and we're able to develop um, more autonomous types of intelligence. Another thing I mentioned earlier is the concept of superhumans and super soldiers. And, you know, the comic books have been writing about these sorts of things for years. And I don't think that these things are actually the, the things of legend or myth anymore. Uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, also known as DARPA, has actually been investigating and researching ways that we can increase the warfighter performance. And part of that is the development of a program called Warrior Web, where they're using new types of technologies and materials to develop basically super suits. It's supposed to help decrease fatigue for a warfighter during battle. It's also helped to improve 
performance. You can see here's an example of one such type of prototype suit where we've got these sort of mechanistic joints. So we have some other sorts of hoses, might be some sort of compression system in conjunction with nano enabled materials, possibly carbon nanotubes or graphene or other sorts of advanced materials. Lots of these types of suits uh, will be very more common than they are now. Uh, the military and other organizations are also using nanomaterials to develop things called metamaterials where we can look at invisibility and cloaking and things like that. So I think that as technology advances, as nanotechnology becomes um, more suited to kind of everyday applications, we'll continue to see a lot of these sorts of devices implemented into um, defense type and security operations. Another really interesting program that DARPA has is um, looking at a neural interface. And what I mean by that is actually some sort of mechanism that can plug into the brain. A lot of us probably have seen the movie The Matrix where people plugged into some sort of alternate reality. Um, experiments have actually been performed on chimpanzees where they took uh, nanotechnology enabled devices, planted them in the brains of chimpanzees, and just by thinking they were able to move prosthetic limbs. So imagine what that would mean for people who suffer from paralysis, certainly for military applications where we're trying to improve the strength of soldiers. Um, very interesting concepts because this all ties into that philosophical idea of, of transhumanism, right? We're using nanotechnology and we're developing it in a way so that we can transcend our human existence, so we can become better than what we are. And while that sounds really cool, and, and it is, there are also some implications that we really need to think about. Should we be creating superhumans? And, and what, what does that mean? What would that mean if wars of the future are fought between super soldiers and autonomous drones? And it's very interesting things. And I think that now is the time as these technologies develop that we really need to start looking at our policies and our regulations and our laws to make sure that we don't repeat any of the darker things in history that have come from abusing technology. So with that, we're going to move on to culture just for a little bit, and we're going to talk about how different cultures use that nanotechnology and how nanotechnology might actually be affecting certain cultures. Some really interesting things here. So just a brief review, culture is a shared language and beliefs and customs of a particular peoples, and these ideas are basically passed down from one generation to the next. All of us in some way belong to many, many cultures, whether it's through our country of origin or whether it's through uh, an organization that we belong to, such as the military. There are always some elements of culture in all of our daily lives. Uh, two concepts that are often interchanged but are very different are race and ethnicity. Race is um, referring to the shared physical traits and characteristics of a particular group. And ethnicity is more of the ancestry. Right, so when we talk about ethnicity, we're talking about things like maybe being from Palestine or maybe being um, Jewish or something like that, um, whereas race would be, you know, the Caucasian, right? So just some different descriptors that we have to remember. But all of these things, culture, race, and ethnicity, for what we as philosophers often call the worldview, right? How we view the world, and how our values are reflected in the world and how we actually instill our culture onto the, the civilizations that we interact with on a daily basis. And so here's some information that came from a study back in 2009 where the researchers actually looked at culture and how these different cultural groups view nanotechnology. And the interesting thing was that basically what they found is that the risk and the benefits of nanotechnology were very different depending on which culture a person belonged to. And I think that's probably common sense. I think a lot of us would probably say, yeah, that seems about right. And you could probably use anything. It wouldn't necessarily have to be nanotechnology. But the interesting thing that I want you to take away from this is that basically where we start from, what our cultural predisposition is, 
is going to determine how we view different technologies and how those are placed within the world. Now, what they also found in the study was that the information that was given to these different groups about nanotechnology also influenced um, their risk of perception, but also their culture had a big role in how they actually use that information. So I think that's very interesting things to keep in mind as well. So I want to talk about something that I think is, is really fascinating, and it's symbolism. In all cultures, religions, ethnicities, everybody has these shared symbols and these, these values and beliefs, and all of these things are reflected in um, you know, our ancestry and how these things are passed down. And so I think a, a really interesting story that I've kind of have pieced together through my research involves an association between the chrysanthemum and a nano flower. So in this picture here, you see on the left, that's a white chrysanthemum. And interesting, in Korean culture, they do not believe that white chrysanthemums should be placed in a hospital room because white chrysanthemums are symbolic of funerals. They're used at funerals, they symbolize death. They should not be in a hospital room where somebody's trying to recover. Nano flower is an actual real thing. This happens to be a creation of zinc oxide, and there are different ways that scientists can actually um, use the zinc oxide and, and develop them through certain techniques to develop the structure that looks very much like a flower. And I put this here to show you the similarities between a chrysanthemum and a nano flower. And so I posed the question, how would you explain to a Korean American or, or anybody in the Korean culture that you were to use something like a nano flower inside of them in a hospital? You know, what are the sorts of things that we need to be thinking about as nanotechnology is creating new site new types of structures and forcing us to really think about things that we never thought about before, we have to keep in mind that there's a lot of symbolism that is running kind of in the background underneath of this. And we have to be mindful that different cultures are going to perceive things in different ways. And even though an anaflower might be a perfectly acceptable scientific or medical intervention, there might be some cultures who might not understand because of language barrier, or there might be a symbolic element that we really have to be mindful of. And so that brings us to our last section here. We're going to talk about religion. And religion is very interesting because religion in itself is its own culture. Different religions have different beliefs and values. Different religions are often associated with particular cultures. And so I think it deserves its own category here. Now, aside from some of the cultural studies that have been done looking at how certain groups view nanotechnology and some of the things that we need to start thinking about, there have actually been a lot of, of articles written about religion and how these different religions view nanotechnology or, or might view nanotechnology. And so just as a primer here, uh, here's some information that was taken from the Pew Research poll looking at religion in the United States. And as you can see, I think no surprise here, the majority of Americans identify as Christian. And, you know, that can be problematic in some ways because generally as you have um, a certain group that, that is dominant, a lot of the regulations and the traditions and the sorts of applications tend to favor that particular group. And so I think it's it's fair to say that, you know, there might be some bias towards Christianity in the United States. And as it turns out, you know, nanotechnology is actually very different within the different subsets of Christianity. And we'll talk about that in a second. But overall, as you can see, uh, there aren't a lot of the other religions represented in the United States. So I think it's it's important that we keep in mind that we're not discriminating against any of these other beliefs and that we have more of a broad view of how nanotechnology might be accepted and viewed by these different religions. And so here's just a brief kind of map of um, different faiths and some of the concerns about nanotechnologies that each one of these faiths might have. 
And so, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we have Christianity in general, then there are different subdivisions of Christianity. So, first of all, you know, in a general sense, um, most Christian scholars who were asked about nanotechnology tend to bring up the transhumanism elements, right, that we can somehow supersede our human species and become super beings. Um, and, and that has religious implications because that gives the connotation that we are somehow becoming more godlike. And I think that, you know, a lot of us can kind of see some of the, the possibilities of, of why that could potentially be harmful. You know, if you are supposed to live a life that, you know, God created us, we are not supposed to be uh, godlike or, or wanting to be like God, that, you know, having nanotechnologies and, and things implanted in our bodies that would make us more superhumans or godlike than we are could potentially underwrite some of the values of religion. Um, embodiment is a, another principle that is, often comes up in these, these writings about nanotechnology and, and Christianity. And embodiment is a very Christian notion that basically says that we should be happy with our imperfect bodies, that we were created by God, that we are perfect the way that we are, and there's no reason that we need to be any better. So as we start looking at how nanotechnology, such as with the super suits or the neural implants, can make us better, do we need to be doing that? Is that right? Is that something that actually fits into the values um, that you know Christians would, would have? Some of the other things here um, within Christianity, Lutherans typically don't have any specific concerns with nanotechnology, just kind of more the, the general ethical concerns. Should we be doing this? Why are we doing this? those sorts of things. Catholicism, typically uh, one of the central pillars of the faith is that the preservation of the sanctity of life, right? Catholics do not believe in abortion or birth control because you're undermining the sanctity of life. So anything that nanotechnology could do in terms of possibly putting life in jeopardy would of course be taboo. Um, I thought Islam was a very interesting one and I'll skip down there for a minute. There's an organization called the Taba Foundation, and they had actually put a report out about nanotechnology and Islam and, and some of the things that Muslim scholars need to start thinking about. And a lot of it wasn't necessarily about the religion itself, but it had more of the legal questions that could come up in Islamic law uh, regarding nanotechnology. And I thought that was a very interesting discussion. There really hasn't been much written about Islam and, and nanotechnology, and I think that that would be an area that would be um, worth exploring more. And certainly when you get into the Eastern face, I haven't seen anything about Buddhism or Hinduism, and I think that would be really interesting to see how some of those scholars and religious uh, persons would view nanotechnology. Now, one thing, and I'll leave you with this, uh, Judaism, there's been a lot of writings about, you know, could we potentially create some sort of Frankenstein's monster? You know, in Judaism, uh, the folklores talk about a golem, some sort of character that was developed, you know, to, to serve the intent of its master. So could we potentially use nanotechnology and create a superhuman that somehow got out of control and we would have a, a Frankenstein monster on our hands? So I don't know the answer to that. It's just something to think about. And certainly in Jewish cautionary tales, you know, the Golem would come to mind to, uh, to urge us to not dabble in things that we don't completely understand. And so now we have a little bit of a primer of some of the more esoteric issues of nanotechnology. Let's talk a little bit about how they apply to everyday life and what we can do to potentially limit some of these implications. So first of all, I want to show you a study that was done here recently, and I think this was in the uh, United Kingdom. So if you remember earlier, when we looked at the slide that had the different pictures of products that contain nanomaterials, and I should have remember that slide. Well, this slide here shows basically a scale of, um, of acceptance. People were asked these questions about you know, how likely they would use, be to use sunscreens with nanomaterials in them or eat foods with nanomaterials in them and that sort of stuff. As you can see, this deep red um, bar here shows, you know, extremely likely and it goes all the way to the right where people say, I don't know. 
Well, I think it's really interesting that a lot of people probably don't even realize that the products that they're using on an everyday basis already have nanomaterials in them. And so for some people who would not necessarily use sunscreen with nanomaterials, probably are. People who say that they wouldn't eat food with nanomaterials, they probably already are. So I think that this kind of shows two things. I think that a lot of people just really aren't familiar with nanotechnology. And I think that the other thing is that scientists and researchers really are very good at communicating what nanotechnology is, or communicating the research. And I think that that's, those are two things that really need to be developed better. And you know, there's different ways that, that that can be done. But I think it's certainly something that needs to be looked at. Interestingly enough, uh, there was another study that was done looking at how people understand the technology and, and how familiar they are with it. And it was really funny because in this study, people who were more familiar with sci other scientific concepts, such as you know um, climate change and um, sustainable development and those sorts of things, tended to think that nanotechnology and these other emerging technologies had more benefit than risk. And people who weren't familiar with nanotechnology also tended to not be familiar with other sorts of technologies, and their perception was the opposite. They believed that there was more risk and less benefit. So I think that that's just a reflection of, of a knowledge gap, and I think that's something that, that needs to be changed. And so what can we do to make sure that as new technologies such as nanotechnology are developed that we don't repeat any of the you know, unfortunate happenings of the past? And I think that a lot of it comes out of cultural competence. I think that we need to make sure that certainly human subjects research involving nanotechnology adheres to all the, the current guidelines and regulations that we're getting informed consent, that we're explaining these procedures to you know, patients that they really understand what is happening and, and what potentially could be the outcomes of some of these things. Um, neural implants would be something that you know, could be quite scary to somebody. And in certain situations, you know, somebody might be forced or feel forced to participate in an experiment. So we need to make sure that we're exploiting all of the, the implications. Uh, to patients or to other participants and studies that would involve, you know, clinical aspects of nanotechnology. One other thing that I think we can do is we can incorporate um, this cultural competence model into regulations and into, you know, daily operations and the institutions that would be doing this sort of research or, you know, using these sort of applications. And a good model comes from Cross. This is back from, I think, the late 80s. And, you know, there's these five points here that are really good to just keep in mind. And as you develop directives and other operational sorts of guidelines for nanotechnology and how that's going to be used, especially in a situation where people of different cultures and races and religions are going to be present, and we just keep in mind how all of these different groups, you know, have different worldviews and how they might be affected differently by nanotechnology. Also, there could be language barriers, and we have to make sure that as researchers and as scientists that we are communicating the risks and the benefits and just the general knowledge of nanotechnology in plain language so that they can understand what we are actually talking about and what we're going to do. And I think the final takeaway from this slide is that we need to make sure we are avoiding ethnocentrism. And ethnocentrism is the act of judging another culture by the values and standards of one's own culture. In other words, you know, if I'm an American, I tend to look at people who live in other countries and judge them by my standard as being an American. And we have to make sure that we don't do that sort of thing, that we really limit um, the view that we have from our own culture and that we try to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes and we try to understand how they would feel based on their values and beliefs and knowledge about something like nanotechnology being used in a medical application or some other sort of application. 
And so just to wrap some things up, I thought this was a um, pretty good quote from Jameson Wetmore. People with technology together shape both technological and social features of a new technology. People must direct it, and despite some complicated issues, they can still have input into the process. And so as we move forward with nanotechnology into this, this new world, I think it's important that we keep two things in mind, that nanotechnology certainly has, you know, a great advantage and benefit to improve our lives in so many ways, in environmental applications, in green living, in medical applications, you know, the list goes on and on. But we also have to keep in mind that we need to develop nanotechnology responsibly. We need to look at the potential applications, we need to do our research, and we need to have sound science, we need to have regulations in place as the science develops so we can protect society, that we can protect each other from ourselves, and that we can ensure that we don't repeat any devastating examples of past misuses of nanotechnology, or any technology uh, for that matter. And so with that, I thank you very much for your time today, and I'll turn it back over to Stuart. Greg, thank you so much for your insights and, and the interesting uh, webinar today on nanotechnology. Uh, you can reach Greg at the information there on this, uh, this slide. If you have any questions, you can also reach out to uh, the HDI or me directly. Thanks again, Greg. Uh, thank you for attending, and have a great day. Goodbye.